good day to you all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was trying to try out good day, you know what I mean? You guys get a lot of good mornings, and uh, good day is similar but not the same. So um, anyway, I um, wanted to just, just mention to you guys something that we talked about a few months ago, or maybe it's been a month or six weeks ago, something just um, to keep in the forefront of your mind. We are looking at um, continuing to move forward with, uh, with moving, asking some of you to consider going to the first service of the church. And so this involves us also building out the children's ministry in the first service. So um, these two elements, so we had hoped we'd be able to roll something out in July, June. I'm sorry, that was the hope. But the more we've looked at all the specifics and the details and what goes into that, uh, we realized we could do a crash and burn rollout in June, or we could do it right if we, if we work it out the details between now and August. So it's going to be more like August before we're able to roll that out. But we would just like you guys to be praying, one, praying over the transition, because we're just needing the space. Um, most of the time in second service, we end up with, it's pretty full, the parking is full, the kids' ministry is packed full. And just trying to trying to make all these details work. So, um, so if you have, think about it like this: like if you have, because there's lots of reasons people go to different services. Um, but if your family, if you guys are early risers, naturally anyway, if you got friends, friends, and you can like lead your friend group to first service, you know what I mean? And you guys have kids, the whole thing. Just think about it. We're like I said, we we are not necessarily going to step in and man, we're not going to force anybody <laughs> to go to first service. Obviously, because how would we enforce that? It's like you come or you, you come or you don't. But we would like you guys to be praying about that. And and if God is leading you to do that, um, and from the standpoint of just. Um, why it matters, I think, I think we have to think of it like um, we're kind of asking the mature among us to make a sacrifice so that the church can continue to grow in this space, which is good for everybody. Um, the, the, um, yeah, it's, 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 harder to, it's harder to get up early and get everything going and be at the first service, but if, if, you, if you feel like God is calling you to that, it would really help us because we don't have, right now, we don't have any clear leading from the Lord about, about a different facility, another place, anything like that. And we haven't really outgrown this facility. We've just outgrown the parking lot and the kids' ministry. <laughs> so, those are the, so the only solution that seems uh, apparent is to try to, move, try, to, try to build out the first service portion of things. So anyway, um, just keeping that in front of you um, as we move toward August and work on that. If you have got it in your heart to serve in kids and you're not currently, please let Lisa know. She wants, she's really eager to build that team. And um, so if you're just thinking like, yeah, I want to be a part of, I want to be a part of like the mobilization unit for first service, and that's you, well, um, she'd love to hear from you on that. So that said... Let's pray. Father, thank you for the morning. Thank you that every day is a new day and that there's new mercy. Lord, new grace, fresh bread from heaven for us today. So thank you for your word, Lord, and how you feed us so faithfully. And I just want to ask, Lord God, that you would, by your presence here with us, Lord, would give life to us. Lord, we pray that more and more we would be conformed to the likeness of Jesus And that we, for our part, Lord, would lay down everything you ask us to lay down, that we'd take up everything you ask us to take up, and that we would walk in our identities in Christ as the redeemed children of God. And I ask, Lord, that you would speak today and that everyone would hear what they need to hear and that that word would be received in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 12 today. Matthew chapter 12 at the very beginning. And um, this message, I'm called Legalism and Liberty because we're going we're gonna to watch an exchange uh, between Jesus, his disciples, and the Pharisees. And then we're going to see Jesus in the synagogue kind of through a, through a miraculous healing We're going to see Jesus kind of illustrate the point of everything he'd been saying with the Pharisees. And uh, so I want to talk to you quick, just sort of introduction-wise, just to to open up, get our minds on the same, into the same place together as we go into the scriptures, um, about legalism and what it is. 
and about liberty in the Holy Spirit and what that is. So I, I have had, I've really seen two different kinds of believers who are most ripe to become a legalistic person. And it's those who have been raised in a, an ultra-conservative, uh, ultra-conservative uh, religious environment where there is, I would call it maybe like a hyper-literal interpretation of Scripture. And we believe in a more or less literal interpretation of Scripture here. Um, but hyper-literal is kind of like everything that's ever been written is always for all believers. And so it creates this huge like mound of confusion when you try to practice your faith under a hyper-literal interpretation. Like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, go sell everything you have. Give your money to the poor and then come follow me. And then people, and then you take that and then you take that which was written by inspiration of the spirit, the words of Jesus. You take that word that was written or that was spoken by Jesus and then you etch it into stone and say, every believer needs to sell all their possessions, give all their money to the poor and then you come follow Jesus. That's Jesus' requirement for following him. Well, clearly, we can't all do that. You know what I mean? Everybody can't sell all they have. So, so, so what we do as believers is in terms of the way that, and liber- this is more on the liberty side, is we read that and we say, well, that's what Jesus is asking of the rich young ruler, but what's he asking of me? What is Jesus saying to me? Because surely there's a sacrifice required in my faith to follow Jesus, so what is it, Lord? And, and we learn to, to take the promptings of different things, but we also employ our intellect to understand the difference. Some things are definitely for all believers, and some things are more specifically interpreted. But legal, a legalistic environment, um, and I say ultra-conservative, the word conservative, I'm not against the conservative. I probably lean more conservative than most things anyways. But, um, but um, the word conservative has come to mean cautious. <laughs> and I think there's people who, have, who see the word liberty and they have associations of fear with the word liberty. Like, liberty, that sounds dangerous. Well, you know, somebody says, well, let's talk about liberty in the Lord. And, people, and their first response is, if you're a legalistic person or, or, or have those tendencies, the first response to the word liberty is, well, you've got to give the caveat. Well, you've got to be careful because this could happen. Well, I knew a guy, you know what I mean? Somebody taught him about grace, and he started sinning and using grace as a license to sin. Well, the Bible talks about that. And does that happen? Yes, that happens. Um, But liberty is actually one of the most important defining qualities of a healthy faith. And um, legalism is a kind of stricture that chokes healthy faith. So that's the first environment where I've seen people are kind of ripe for legalism is when you've been raised in that kind of environment or you had your uh, like significant, uh, you were mentored by somebody who that was their world or whatever it was, but it had something to do centrally to your faith. The other is when you're having a personal revival, when you yourself are experiencing great things in God because what happens when you're really experiencing things with the Spirit of God, it's your heart is just opened up and you're just going, Lord, whatever you say, Whatever you want, Lord, I'm yours. If you say do it, I'm doing it. If I'm going to obey you and whatever it is, Lord, you just show me whatever you want. I remember like having one of these in, in the midst of kind of a personal revival myself and, and like when I was a young believer and I, and I was like, show me, Lord, what you want. And I opened the Bible to my daily reading and it was the Nazarite vow. You know, the Nazarite vow, you don't cut your hair, you don't go to funerals, you're not around dead people, you don't drink wine, nothing from the fruit of the vine. And I was reading it, and I was like, well, Lord, I had just asked you this morning what you wanted for me. This is that hyper-literal. And it's like, so maybe you want me to take the Nazarite vow. Maybe that's what you want. And I was like ready, and it's like, but I mean, thankfully, that one only lasted two or three days before that kind of wore off. But it was like, that was the kind of the attitude. But when you're in that mode of like, God will do whatever you want. God, I'm, I'm here for you. Like, that's a good place to be. Can we agree on that? Where we're submitting our hearts to the Lord. Well, the devil wants to get in there and put you back in chains. Wants to get you like hyper-focused on micro stuff so that you're missing the big picture. And so we have to be super cautious to, I hear I'm talking about caution, but you do need to exercise some caution, right? But legalism is, is catastrophically harmful to our faith, to a real faith. And so legalism would maybe be defined by uh, having believed, now trying by works to get into good standing with God. Having believed, now on the other side of that belief, 
trying to, to, use, to use works to try to get to a certain place spiritually, like thinking that works will be the way. And so Paul challenged like the church at Galatia and said, he said, you started in faith. So, so who cut in on you? These were the words that he used. Who cut in on you um, and distracted you from a sincere devotion to Jesus Christ is kind of the idea. And so, um, so, so when, you, when you come into the faith by faith and start to walk by faith, guess what? Your progress also happens by faith as you believe and obey, believe and obey. Um, but we're going to see what this is. Um, but as far as liberty goes, the scripture says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I mean, that's, I don't, I'm not saying that's a holistic statement of everything you need to know about your faith, but you do need to know that. That it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so if, if you're a person who struggles with the, constrict, with the, st- the stricture of, and micro, micro-focused, micromanagement and things like that, we want to really see the Lord give you, bring you forward into a place of liberty in your faith. And um, so let's, let's go into it. We'll look here at Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. So, so let's, let's just revisit this, this little section real quick. So, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field because who knows why. Maybe that's the shortest distance between there and where they're trying to go. They're cutting through a field. Well, the disciples are a little hungry. And hunger is simple, right? I'm hungry. Oh, look, here's some grain. So they're they're getting little handfuls off the little heads of the grain and stripping off the little grains and they're eating them. It's it's what we call in our culture snacking. You're just snacking, right? So he's snacking. He's just having little, little pieces of grain, right? No big deal. You're hungry. You eat a little something and everything's fine. But the Pharisees, I mean, they just they're somehow always manage to be there. And they're looking and there's, here it is. They're, they look and they're watching and they, t- they have to go to Jesus and tell on the disciples. They look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on a Sabbath. And so immediately, as soon as we read that, we should ask a question. Is that statement true? Is it true that it is a violation of the law for people walking through a field to gather little pieces of grain and eat those for a snack? Is that actually a violation of the law? And uh, you could, from the Pharisees' perspective, you, they probably saw it like this. First of all, Jesus was walking on the Sabbath, which was which is, it was risky. Because they actually had rules written. So there's the law, and then there's the, the, the Pharisees had written whole volumes of additional information for, for additional specifics on how to practice. You know, because guess what? People are coming to them and say, well, what can I do? And what can I not do? And they say, well, we, we better clarify this. So they actually had listed out how many steps you could take on a Sabbath day. How many steps from your home you could go and then how many steps back? And you had to remember the steps back count too, you know what I mean? So you've got to figure it all out before you leave the house. Well, Jesus was walking. Now, Jesus kind of gets around that one because he didn't have a home to count the steps from. But he's still, he's walking. But then he puts himself in the place of temptation, don't you see? He walks through a grain field. So they walk through the grain field. And now guess what happens? Well, of course, when you're in a grain field, you get hungry. Because there's the grain. So then they're picking it and they're eating. Anyway, I searched the actual law this week to see, to see, like, what could they have been referring to that spoke specifically to this thing of, of, of eating grain or anything like that as you go through a grain field? And um, from my uh, careful searching, I was able to find literally nothing that states that what they were doing was in any way a violation of anything written in the law. This is what the law says. First of all, it says, you must not do any regular work on a Sabbath. So regular work is the first part. And then it says, you must observe a complete rest 
It says, I like that word, complete rest. It's like saying, no, don't do it halfway. Like, actually rest. So no regular work and a complete rest. So if, so let's just say John, the, the disciple John, let's just say John had hitched up some sort of harvesting unit to a couple of mules, and he's out there, guys, I'll show you how we get a snack, and starts harvesting the field, well, you might have something that the Pharisees could look at and go, hold on a second, that looks like work on the Sabbath. But they're nowhere close to that. And so this is, this is kind of my point. So these guys are willing now at this point, having made their own particulars about what the law said, they're willing now to put their particular interpretations on par with the actual law of God and say our convictions was just more or less what they were. Our convictions have the same weight as the word of God. And by the time you get to the convictions, you've lost sight of the word of God because the word of God doesn't say anything about that you couldn't go for a walk and pick little things and, and eat them while you go. Of course, that's pretty common sense that that would be fine. No one's going to think that that's work. And it's not in any way necessarily keeping you from, from resting, just going for a little stroll or whatever. But the point is, they were making their particulars, they were giving it the same weight as God's word, even though God's word in no place said this was a violation of the law. So the disciples were responding to a basic physical need, which was hunger. And the solution for them was also simple. You just pick a little grain and you eat it. That's what we might call a happy, common sense life. It's like reading Tom Sawyer, you know what I mean? The Pharisees, because they had more going on than just their desire to interpret the law. They're in their desire to discredit Jesus because that's a big part of what they were doing. They ended up actually discrediting the character of God. So I answer this question, does God's law, well, we just talked about this, does God's law really prohibit hungry people from getting food on the Sabbath? The reason I say that they discredited God's character was that, think about what it says about God. If for someone to walk through a field who's hungry and pick little pieces of grain and eat those pieces of grain, for someone to do that is, a, is something that displeases God greatly to the point that he would make rules against it and make sure that it never happened. And then he would send religious leaders out to make sure that there was enforcement. You know what I mean? This sounds like something out of 1984. It's like Big Brother is watching. He saw you pick those little pieces of grain. You know, getting into the minutia and the particulars and saying this is the only way to practice righteousness. And it makes God seem petty. And it makes God seem out of touch. And it makes God seem like a micromanager. And it makes God seem so different than what he, how he actually is, which is kind and generous and open-hearted and open-handed. A loving father, sorry about that, who when people are hungry, he wants them to have something to eat. And so they actually ended up discrediting the heart of God by getting into the particulars I saw this meme where somebody said, did you ever notice that if you walk through Walmart eating grapes out of the bag, nobody says anything. But as soon as you tear into a rotisserie chicken, the security is just right there. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that was funny because you, you think about it, it's like, yeah, that's actually kind of true. It's like if somebody, you know, nobody really notices. It's like what the Pharisees were noticing here. It's like the picking at the grapes in Walmart. But um, by the way, grapes are sold by the pound, so it is stealing. Write that down. But, but everybody's got different standards is the point. It's like, why, why is it somehow like I'm paying for these at the register so it doesn't matter versus like, why do, you, why do you just somehow instinctively know you can't rip into a rotisserie chicken? Anyway, the point is people's standards vary all across the board. And so we're, the whole target of this, this whole thing where we're trying to really find is that place in faith where we're walking in liberty and we're seeking God and we're learning how to please him without coming under the, the coming back under a, a yoke of slavery where everything is about the particulars. I'll just give you an example to try to understand like the heart of God. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. This is from the Levitical law. This is not about the Sabbath, but it is about 
uh, fields and food and hunger than God's heart toward people. It says, Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. That means when you go harvest, don't harvest every square inch. And if you drop something, don't pick it up. And if the machine or machinery or whatever you're using to harvest drops things, don't pick it up. And then he says, nor shall you glean your vineyard. That's where you grow your grapes and all this. Nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. So if it falls on the ground, just leave it. You shall leave them, God says, for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So you see how God seals it with his own name? He says, leave that. Like, like you dropped it, leave it. And remind yourself, someone will walk through this field one day and be hungry. And there'll be something there for them to eat. And he said, I'm sealing this with my own name, by the way. I take this seriously. I'm the Lord your God. Leave something for the poor and for the, and for the stranger, for the person who's wandering through your land. So a passage like this, even though, like I said, it's not about the Sabbath, it does give us a much clearer sense of God's heart for people, God's compassion. You read this and you go, oh, wait a second, he cares. You know, I might be sitting over here thinking, you know, hey, a penny saves, a penny earned. I, and I pick every little tiny piece of thing. It's like, man, what a thorough harvest that was. I'm taking it all to the market. I'm going to sell it all, maximize profits. And God is saying, you can't live like that. You have to always leave a part of your heart open to people who, don't, who are not as fortunate as you. And you need to be intentional about leaving something behind so that somebody else who needs it can pick it up. And so the Pharisees are not in this, you know what I mean? They, read these, they would have read these same passages too, but they're not factoring this. Why? Because they're much more interested in catching Jesus in some kind of wrongdoing. But legalism was their mode of operation, strict enforcement. And they got to decide what exactly was going to be strictly enforced. So their idea of righteousness was only superficial. The law doesn't technically say you can't, but we don't collect grain, so you shouldn't collect grain either. Have you ever met anybody who wanted you to live under their convictions? Have you ever tried to make somebody else live under your convictions? Well, I don't believe that kind of music is from, that you could glorify God with that kind of music. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you, it's, have you ever, you know, it's like you point at different things. There's a million different things that we've chosen to say, well, that's bad and that's bad and that's bad. If you drink alcohol, you are sinning against God. You know what I mean? I noticed Jason said grape juice this morning in the, in the communion, and I thought, it was juice from a grape. It was very likely wine. And this is not a promo for alcohol or certainly not alcoholism. I'm just saying the lines are not crystal clear. These are convictions people have. Some people say, I'm okay to have a little alcohol and I'm fine. Other people say, we have alcoholism in my family. I'm not touching it. Other people say, I don't believe biblically it's okay to drink. You know what I mean? My point is, when, but when somebody says, but you have to live like that too or you're sinning against God, that's legalism. Because you are not the one who manages my faith and I'm not the one who manages yours. Each person works out their own salvation before God. And you know what? Because I, I shared this, a guy came, I shared a message like this, I mean, it's been a long time ago. And this guy came to me and he said, after the service, and he said, I'm really struggling with this idea you were talking about, like, like about the Holy Spirit leading people to different convictions. And I said, yeah, he definitely leads people to different convictions. And he said, he said, well, and he gave me an example of a particular conviction that he had. And he said, and then I had this friend. And my friend, he started with what he really wanted to do. And then he sort of reverse engineered it and got all the way back and said, yeah, so I don't believe that's from God anymore. And so he changed his position. But then you know what? It re I realized later on that he was just like kind of just trying to get where he wanted to get anyway. And I said, yeah, that's bad. I said, he, he really shouldn't do that. Um, but that, and none of us should do that. But it doesn't change the fact that God definitely convicts people in different ways. Because what his particular conviction was had nothing to do with right and wrong. It was just how God had led him. And he had worked that out. And guess what? God had blessed him because that was what God asked of him. But it's, it's such a challenge. But you read Romans chapter 14, which is the guidebook to living together in community when you have different convictions. That's what Romans chapter 14 is. And it's like, don't judge your brother whose faith is small because of his many opinions. 
And so what you notice is the more rules I have, all the, all the particular, I have opinions about everything, it seems, the smaller my faith is. And he says, and don't let them judge you because of your liberty. And so big faith means liberty. Small faith means lots of rules. So legalism, as, when, it, when it gets a hold of your faith, it squeezes it and won't let it grow. And so you've got opinions about everything. And you have so many opinions about every, what everybody else is doing. And the one question everybody wants to know is, hey, have you ever taken any time to look at your own life? Because you sure seem awfully consumed with mine. And it's like, here, you know, the Bible says, like, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that is God's way of saying to everybody, mind your own business. Like, actually mind your own business unless it is your business. Like, if it's your child, it's your business. If it's your friend, it's like, you, you might have a, a, a platform in their life, but you're still not the one at the end of the day who makes decisions for them. And so, and if it's just a, somebody you just are observing, you're, let's just face it, you're just being judgmental. It's not your place to decide what's right and wrong for everybody else. So we get into this place, and so um, we can't, we're not here to give other people, tell other people to live under our convictions, and um, we should also not come under this yoke of slavery over someone else's, no, and you have to live this way because God spoke to me about it. Does that make sense? More or less? Yes? No? So it's, it's, it's one of those things that is, this is why the Bible says work out your salvation because it's not all just cut and dry. It's not all straightforward. You have to figure out what God has asked of you and then you live under that. And here's the other thing. It's like 10 years ago, I had some convictions that I don't have anymore. And you know, God was the one who led me in and God was the one who led me out. I'm growing. I'm not who I was anymore. And it's like, no, and none of it ever was about like commands of God. It was just God saying, this is how I want you to live. And so we have to pay attention to those things. But they had a superficial idea about righteousness and they wanted other people to be caught up in that too. Here's the fact. Misery loves company. Have you heard that expression before? When a person is miserable in the way that they're trying to work out their faith, guess what? They want other people to get, they want other people to like, come join me in my misery. You know, they call it a pity party. Let's get everybody, stop smiling. I, I, I'm going to share with you the best way to please God. And then it's a massive list as long as your arm of things that you should not do. And none of them are clearly spelled out in Scripture. There's some verses that kind of allude to those things, but none of it's crystal clear. And it's like, but it's just enough to make you feel guilty every time you try to do those things. And so what do you do? Well, better safe than sorry. That's the conservative aspect of, of legalism. It's like caution. Well, better safe than sorry. We don't want to depart too far. What if it is? Maybe. And then we get ourselves into this place where we can't do anything. Like you, have, you had freedom, now you don't have freedom. You know? And so we have to really be careful what kind of things we take on in that sense. Misery loves company because, and so, well, and so does a faith defined by little liberty and lots of rules. This is the essence of legalism. So I want to sh say this to you um, because this is really not just about what you do. This is so much about what you really believe about God. This is the key. This is the key right here. Jesus had a big-hearted, wide-armed, welcoming, loving, gracious Father in heaven, and so those were also the attributes of his faith. So this is so much about how you see God. And a legalistic person doesn't just have an issue with um, rules keeping and some wrong theology and some wrong perspectives. They also have a small God who's a micromanager, a small God who's, who's overly concerned about inconsequential things, a, a God who's standing by like a schoolmaster with a ruler that if you reach for the wrong thing, shh, just slap your hand. And you're not even willing to take a chance. You know what I mean? You can't even venture out because always there's this little voice saying, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. Well, God is sure about a lot of things. And this little constant nagging, doubting voice is just that most of the time it's not the Holy Spirit. Did you hear me say that? The constant nagging, doubting voice is probably not the Holy Spirit because God is really clear 
on where he stands, and he's really capable of guiding you clearly into what he, what he wants you to do. And I think most of the time, we, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. The Pharisees had a stingy, close-hearted, tight-fisted, micromanaging God, and so, surprise, surprise, their faith also followed suit. So how do you see God? How do you see God? Do you remember the parable of the talents? And everybody got the talents, different amounts of talents. It was a trust of money to go do something with. The master went away to a foreign land. He came back and he called his servants in to give an account for what they'd done with the money. And the first guy says, you gave me 10 and I made 10 more. Or five and five more, however it was, a couple different versions of the story. But I doubled your money. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Next servant, come on in. I doubled your money, master. And the master's like, I love it. Beautiful, awesome, great. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then the last guy comes in. He got the least because he was the one the, the master had the least confidence in. You know, that's kind of what the, what the impression is you get. But he was giving him a chance. And he said, well, I took your money and I buried it in the ground. Because, and he's saying all this to the master. And he says, because I knew you were a hard master, reaping where you have not sown. In other words, you demand something when you haven't given anything to help. Like you want something back from a harvest that's not yours. He said, he said I know that you're a hard man. And, and the master's over here going, didn't I give you the talent? How can you say I would ask for something when I hadn't sown anything? I gave you what you had to start with and you buried it. You should have at least put it on with the bank. Like that's kind of just common sense. You could have gotten a little interest. So he takes his away and gives it to the one who had the most. But the whole thing, he, did, he, did, he didn't go wrong because of bad financial advice. He went wrong because of a wrong understanding of the master. He misunderstood his character. And so guess what he wasn't willing to do? Take chances. He wasn't willing to take a chance. And that's what legalism does to us. Makes you bury, and think about the significance of the idea of burying your talent. That's what you have. Believers all through the church, God's given them gifts and abilities, talents, things to use for his glory, and they just bury them in the ground. They won't take a chance because, well, what if I did it for my own glory instead of God's? It's like God will say, you did that for your own glory and not mine. Repent. Okay, I forgive you. All right, back to it. That's what it's like with God. It's like if you're waiting for a pure motive, you're going to die waiting. Because you'll find out there's something broken in us all the time. And so when God shows it to you, you say, oh, Lord, I just realized, like, I thought I was doing that for you, but I was, he speaks to us about those things. We repent and we say, purify me, wash me in the blood of Jesus, change me, mature me, grow me, make me more like you. But you don't stop moving forward because you, want, because you need everything to be perfect. That's legalism. It binds your hands, keeps your faith small. It shrinks your whole life. Guess what happens? You don't get to have very many friends if you're legalistic. Because nobody can live up to your standard. And you know who's the worst at failing you at your standard? You are. You can't live up to it. So you're under condemnation all the time. This is just, it, it's an absolute pile of misery. And then, and then it's like, judge everybody by that and try to get, why would you want other people and why would anybody else want to? Because they're like, you know what Jesus said? It's like, I mean, it's like the kingdom of God or the scripture says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So I'll, I know who's got liberty. I know who's walking in liberty because you know what's happening? Righteousness is manifesting in their life. Peace, which is an overflow because things are right. You get the righteousness, peace in place. Then peace comes after that because you stop sowing all the seeds of unrighteousness that cause trouble. So you end up with peace in your heart, which, is, which settles your life. And then joy in the Holy Spirit because everything's right and your life is settled. And now God is king. You're happy, fulfilled. It's like that's what God says the kingdom of God is. And you look at a person whose life is legalistic and they're miserable. And they never have peace. They're always troubled about everything. And there's no sense of righteousness. The kingdom of God has phew, departed. Because it's not central. It's, it's, it's a whole other thing. And guys, there's whole denominations of Christianity because they have rejected the Holy Spirit where the liberty is, as the Bible says that, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Because they have rejected the Holy Spirit, they have only one thing left to put themselves back under law, 
and try to please God by actions, try to get there. And it's the, it's the inevitable or the, the proverbial carrot on the stick. That's what God's favor becomes to them because God, and not because God won't give it, but because they think you can get it by working. And so it's always out of reach. Well, I got to do one more thing. I got to sacrifice one more thing. I got to let something else go while God convicted me again. It's the seventh time this week. I'm letting another thing go. And it's like your life's getting stripped down to this. There's just nothing left. Anyway, I have been legalistic in the past. So I'm, what I'm sharing with you guys about this is it's like, it's kind of like my testimony. You know what I mean? I've been this person. So save yourself the trouble, right? Don't be that person. Don't, don't, don't go down that road because it always leads to the same place. <clears throat> Matthew, let's look at Matthew 12, 3. So Jesus is going to speak the truth. Oh, I've skipped something. Practically, this is what I've been driving at here. Faith is a direct reflection of the God we really believe in. That's what I want you to understand. The way your faith works itself out is directly related to how you see God. Why? Because God is perfect. God is the ideal. He's everything we should want to be. I know you can't be God, but you know what I'm saying? Jesus is calling us to be conformed to the likeness of God in our characters and in a, in a whole host of ways. And so what you really believe about God manifests in your life. Matthew 12, 3, Jesus is going to speak to the Pharisees. He's going to give them the keys to get out of their own prison. These guys respect the scriptures. They love the patriarchs. So let's give them the truth. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. He asks these questions and just leaves it. Just lets it hang there. Haven't you read? You guys respect the scriptures, right? This is in the scriptures. You guys remember David? Yeah. You like David, don't you? Yeah, you do. Well, David did all of this, him and his companions, not priests. And yet the priests had like yesterday's, what they called the show bread, the bread of the presence. It was sacred for the priest for food. After they had get, put it up for God, they could take the bread from yesterday and they could eat the, that bread. And the priest said, well, we have this. They gave it to David and his companions, no questions asked. They were not priests. And they said, here, you have this. And what was the central thing? They were hungry and there was bread in the house of God. And God said, that's fine. Feed them, they're hungry. And, and, but for a Pharisee, for a legalist, legalistic person, that's too much liberty. You can't take those kind of chances. That was the sacred bread. Yeah, it was. And God said, but it's bread and they're hungry, so give it to them. Or have you not read in the law, verse 5, that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent. You know what the priests are doing on the day everybody else is supposed to rest? Working. They are working, working their tails off, morning, noon, and night. But I say to you, Jesus said in verse 6, that something greater than the temple is here. Something greater. He's talking about himself. Something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, he's, Jesus is saying this with, so, with regret. If you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice. Pay attention to those words you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So they had missed who Jesus was. They had missed the point of the commandments. They had missed um, some of the significant stories throughout Scripture that would have given them some freedom. They had missed all of these things because of legalistic interpretations. And, and there's, there's other factors going on here. Like I said, they want to condemn, condemn Jesus, and the law is just the easiest way they have to do that. But he said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So at the end of the day, fellas, there's the law, there's the things that we see, the precedents that have been set, the things I've shared with you in Scripture. But at the end of the day, I'm Lord of the Sabbath and if I want my, my, my servants, my followers to eat grain in a field, guess what? They can eat grain in a field because I'm the Lord of this day. And he was introducing them to, I mean, you know, this, so here's more blasphemy. Just, you know, that one went down in the books. 
But Jesus is just saying, look, if I say you can, you can. That's liberty. That's what it is to have liberty in Christ. And it's like, it's not going to be in violation of some written thing, you know, the things we know that are, that are fixed, the standards that God holds to. There's not going to be anything that violates God's character that he gives us permission to do. But there is a whole lot of freedom in following Jesus, a whole life of freedom. <clears throat> And so Jesus said to them, if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. That comes from Matthew. It's it's referring to the Old Testament, but it's in Matthew 9, Jesus had given them a homework assignment. He said to them, go and learn what this means. This is just two chapters back in the same book. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy or compassion and not a sacrifice. And guess what? They didn't do the assignment. Who's ever had a homework assignment given to them and didn't do it? Proud show of hands. Who did it this week? This week? Okay, I thought so. They had a homework assignment given to them by Jesus. He said, basically said, go home and study this. You guys like to study? I'll give you something to study. Here it is. I desire, study God's words. I desire compassion or mercy and not a sacrifice. Study that. And then, When we come back together, we can chat about what it means. Well, they didn't look it up. They didn't study it. They didn't find out. And what happened? They ended up condemning the innocent. And that is what a legalistic life will have you doing. It squeezes your life, keeps it from growing, keeps your friend group small, keeps God small, keeps everything small, and then you end up doing what? Condemning the innocent everywhere you go. Because you can't help yourself. You feel so under judgment that you have, you have got a lot of extra and you're just giving it away. Judgment, 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 judgment. It's for you. Judgment for you. Tell them, I'm just trying to tell them about, try to tell somebody about their weekend, about my weekend or whatever. It's like, judgment, judgment, judgment. It's like, oh, you did that? Judgment. If you didn't pray enough this week, pastor, judgment. You know, it's like just, <laughs> there are people that cannot help themselves. I knew a lady once and I, once, and I, I decided after spending a lot of time hearing her share things with me about church, our church, the church, churches, <laughs> that her life verse must have been the verse from Ezekiel where it says, do you see the elders of Israel, son of man? Yes, I see them. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? <laughs> I was like, I decided like, because it felt like, I think she had like been self-assigned the judge of all elders in every church she'd ever been a part of. And guess what? When she came into our church, there was a crisis that came up. She was involved and then involved too much. And then guess what she did? Judgment. She cast judgment over every decision that the leaders made, couldn't be satisfied, couldn't be calmed down, couldn't be reasoned with, left the church. And it was so, it's, it's grievous and it's spiritual and it's dark and it's like, this is heavy stuff. And I'm saying this to you guys because like, if you're seeing this, I, I'm hoping, I don't look at our church and say, well, we've got a stronghold of legalism here. That's not why I'm sharing this. I'm sharing this because this is the Bible. It's what we're reading. <laughs> but, but what I want you to understand is you do not want to tolerate a single root or seed of, of this kind of, of thinking or belief about God or the way that you work out your faith. You do not want legalism to touch you, not even a little bit. Because it will tie you up It'll bind you. At first, it'll seem like righteousness. At first, it'll seem like, well, it's just me being serious about my faith. At first, it'll seem like that. And then, it's, and then, then you find you're not just, it's not the sword of the Spirit so that you can grow and God can do His work in you. It's the sword of the Spirit so you can slay your brother. And God wants to set us free and save us from that. And they didn't do the assignment. If they had, they might have made a discovery. And guess what? God loves people. His rules and his commands are meant primarily to benefit, not restrict those people. If if I tell my child, don't run into the street, is it because I want to restrict them? Is it because I don't, is it because there's so many good things in the street I'm trying to keep them from? It's like, no, there's fast cars in the street. And statistically, if you and a fast car collide, you're not going to come out the victor. So I don't want you to run in the street because I care too much about you. The goal is not restriction. It's your well-being. And God's heart toward us is not to restrict. Like, they've got too much freedom. They need more rules. 
That's a wrong view of God. God, and so if God speaks to you, don't turn that kind of stuff on him. You know how long God's been around? Like a really long time. He's heard everything by now. A million times. We're fairly predictable, people are. And we, sit, and we get so impassioned that we say, I don't know, I don't, I've been holding out, God. I didn't want to say this to you, but here it comes. And God's heard it literally 10 million times from different people. And it's like, so just open it up. But it's like, when well, you're feeling that stuff with God and you throw these things at him, God is, he's, you just got to give him, a, give him a chance because his heart for you is so robust and full of love and grace and compassion and mercy. When you're frustrated and angry with God, there's probably something that you haven't seen that you need to see. And so we got to calm down and change our attitude and, and give God credit. He gave his son for us. He gave his most precious so that we could be redeemed. Is he really out to get you and to keep you from freedom? When the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. <clears throat> Mark 2, 27, Jesus said, here's the right perspective. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this is the difference in the two perspectives of God. The one thinks the, the man is made to keep the rules. That's what God wants from the man or the woman. He wants them to keep rules. The other says, the rules were given to us as a benefit because God is good. Think about, our, you know, when you're a kid and, and your parents told you, hey, hey, little buddy or little darling, it's time for a nap. What did you say? I don't want, you know, a big fit, right? I don't want, I don't want, I got want to do this. I don't want to lay down. I don't want to lay down. You know what I mean? That's when, you're, that's when you're little. It's like, I'm 42. You start talking to me about a nap. I mean, I'll be nodding off before you're finished telling me. Like, I'm so on board with this idea. My attitude, the way I see rest has changed, right? And it's like Jesus is saying, God told you to not work one day and you're mad at God. He said, you don't have to go to work. He said, don't leave the house and work. Don't find stuff to do. Like, just rest. A complete rest. No regular work. And it's like, God is punishing us. <laughs> Listen, guys, I don't need a command anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, if it's time to rest, you rest because you're tired. But God gave that as a gift to mankind. And what do the Pharisees do? What did legalism do? It stole the rest from the rest day. Because you've got to be super careful not to take too many steps. Super careful, how much can you lift? They had rules about how much you could lift in your own house. You can lift this much, but not that much. And you've got to sit there and think like, and then if you do the wrong thing, you've got to repent. Think about how, you, how, much, how much rest are you getting on that day? No, no, it's like, you just, I'm just going to just put me in a straight jacket and put me on the couch. Or else I'm going to break something. I'm going to break a rule of some kind. So it takes all the peace out of the rest day. Here's what I'm driving at with all this. Jesus is calling us into a faith that is defined by what it does, not by what it does not do. And so you ask somebody, how do you practice, what does it look like for you to practice your faith in Jesus? And listen to how they answer, or for your own benefit, answer the question yourself. What does it look like for you to practice your faith in Jesus? Oh, well, I mean, a good answer would be something like, well, um, when I get up in the morning, I, I pray and I read my Bible because I want to spend time with Jesus. I want to get to know him. Um, and then when I'm, it's time for me to leave the house, I'm usually asking God to like, give me the right heart toward people because it can be hard sometimes to love people the way that you should, but I want to have his heart toward people, so I ask him for that. When he puts something in my heart, like a word for somebody or go pray for that person or like, or like something, or Whatever it is, like, I, I really try to be available to him to do those things. And then when I go to my job, I mean, I'm working my job. Yeah, I work for my boss, but like, I'm really working for Jesus. Like, I want to do everything in a way that pleases him. So I'm trying to show excellence in all those things. Um, you know, and then it's like when I, and my point is like, if, if somebody starts sharing this, it's like, what is all that? This is what I do. 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 This is how knowing Jesus has impacted every decision that I make. It's so healthy. So healthy. You know what they taught me in Sunday school? I don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang around with people who do. <laughs> That's what I got. That's the foundational verse. <clears throat> 
trouble is, Jesus did hang around with people who do. That's the trouble. So don't, you know, it's like, and plus, that ain't righteousness either. Can I just go ahead and point that out? If you don't smoke, drink, or chew, you know, it's like, what? But, I mean, there's some things that are given. It's like, you know, Jesus, for example, wouldn't vape. We can, we can just go ahead and settle that. It's, like, it's pina colada flavor, boys. So, what, what are the chances? Not very good. But, my, but that's not righteousness. Can we agree that that's, this short list of things that you don't do is not righteousness? And not hanging around with people who do, that's not righteousness either. You know what I mean? What are you a light for if you're never exposed to the darkness or the darkness is never exposed to you? So that's not, you need to have a faith that does something, not doesn't do things. We've got to wrap up in Matthew 12, 9. Departing from there, Jesus, I love this. It says, he went into their synagogue. This is this guy. You can't stop him. You try to discourage him out in the field. He's like, guess what? I'm coming to your church on Sunday, and I'm preaching. <laughs> and just, I just love Jesus' tenacity. You know? In verse 10, and, the, and a man was there whose hand was withered, and they questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, right? Because they're sincere seekers of God, and they want to know the truth. Oh, wait a second. It says right here, so that they might accuse him. They're just hung up on trying to find something wrong with Jesus. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? He's, he asks them these questions, right? And this is really amazing. If you flip over to the book of Mark, this is not on the screen, but in the book of Mark, in the same story, it says, but they kept silent. And in verse five, in that same story in Mark, it says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus answered. He knew they were trying to trap him. Here's a guy with a literally crippled hand. And they said, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or not? And Jesus looked around and it says, with anger, righteous anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And I'm just saying like, that's, that's how Jesus feels about it. Do you know what that means? That's how God in heaven feels about it. When we are missing the point of everything. He wants compassion, not another sacrifice. He's not trying to get you to give something else up. If there's something you got to let go of, he'll let you know about that, but that's not the definition of righteousness. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so Jesus asked the question to give them perspective. If you've got a sheep, you'd help it out on the Sabbath, wouldn't you? And then he says in verse 12, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is within the scope of the law because what did he teach? At a different point, he said that basically love is the sum of the law and the prophets. The love of God, the compassion of God expressed toward people sums up all the law and the prophets. It is lawful to show compassion, to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. And you would hope that if, you, you know, we think like, well, if I was in this situation and I was a Pharisee and I was having all these questions about things and then I asked, and even if my heart was totally to trap Jesus, here's been a miracle right in front of my eyes. So surely now I've seen enough and I'm going to go, wow. I mean, even God is working through this guy on the Sabbath. So maybe my perspective has been wrong. And then you get to verse 14 and it says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him so here's the truth legalism seeks to destroy the life of jesus in you legalism is seeking to destroy the life of jesus in you you will miss the point the point is love the point is compassion the point is not to figure out all the particulars of can and cannot do but it is to get before God's face and make the right decision. You know what I mean? And who cares if anybody else judges you? Do the right thing. That was the way Jesus lived. And that's what he's calling us to. Let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to begin to close out. Jesus was revealing the true heart of God, which so many have misunderstood. So many people, guys, so many children of God have misunderstood the heart of God and Jesus wanted everybody to get it. He was the manifestation of God's true heart. 
If a person's in real need, could God's command not to work on the Sabbath, could that ever be a valid reason to withhold compassion? Could a decision like that please God? I think from what we've seen here, we all say no. No, it couldn't. No, it couldn't. Imagine being so bound up in the wrong understanding of what the commandments or any of it means that it kept you from doing the right thing. It'd be like driving home from church on a Sunday and you see a woman standing by the side of the road, the car, her car tire is flat and she's looking at it with distress and, and you said to yourself, well, I would help her, but it's the Lord's day. <laughs> well, what Lord? Think about it. what it's, it's the Lord's day so we don't help people? What does that say about the Lord? And so we have to really get, this is, and I don't know, that, I don't think we have this necessarily, this problem of over Sabbath keeping as a church. That's not necessarily where, I don't think where we're at. But this principle of this is true. The principle of this is true. God is calling us into a life of compassion. And we have to be careful not to let the little particulars of our own convictions turn into something that God never intended them to be. So let me ask you a few questions. Have the particulars of your convictions or your interpretations of different verses, have those become excuses for withholding basic compassion? Because that's what happens if you follow this road as far as it goes. You end up having excuses, reasons you don't help people. Well, that person got themselves into that mess, so there's no reason I should get them out. Are there people we're judging as unclean or unworthy just because they're hard to love? Sometimes our little particulars, you know what I mean? It's like, we don't like this or we don't like that. And the truth is, you know for a fact, if you invited that person into your home to sit at your dinner table, it would be really awkward and really uncomfortable. And it's just a lot easier for you to tell yourself, you don't have to because of the unrighteous life that they live, because of decisions they've made. But the fact is, he's calling us to love people who are hard to love. <clears throat> Have my personal convictions driven wedges between myself and people God has called me to love? Have your convictions become wedges between you and other people? You need to consider if legalism, if a legalistic life has, has gotten a hold on you. On the other side of things, if we have strong faith and we have liberty in Christ, are we using it to reach out and show compassion in Jesus' name? If you know that you're in a good place with God, like you're in a healthy place spiritually, are you being active and proactive in just in showing compassion to people? He wants compassion, not more sacrifices. Or maybe you're the man with the withered hand and you're in need of grace, you're in need of help, you're in need of healing. I just want to say that Jesus has time for you here and now. And here's the other thing that I'll just point out legalistic faith is like the withered hand you've got the hand is there but it's not useful for anything and so if you are recognizing that you have legalistic tendencies in your own life what I want to say to you is you need the touch of the Savior just as much as anybody else because what does he want to do he wants to take the faith you have which is bound up by legalism and he wants to restore it to full strength he wants to give it back to you so that you can serve, so that you can do good, so that you can love, so that you can not be always trapped by the fact that you can't stop judging everybody else. It's a prison. So I want to encourage you, if that's you, to extend that withered hand to Jesus here this morning and just let him touch it. Let him take the faith you have that's constricted now and let him restore it to health so that it's useful in his hands. Amen. If our prayer teams would come down and be available. Lord, give grace now, I pray in Jesus' name. We need to hear from you. We need to know, God, what, what you see, because sometimes we can't even see it in ourselves. But I pray, God, for each person, Lord, that you would speak to us. What is my withered hand? What's in my life that needs the touch of Jesus? And Lord, if we've been withholding compassion for various reasons, I pray you'd speak to us. And set us free, Lord. Set us free this morning, Lord God, and send us out of here ready to do good, Lord, for your own glory and for your praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name. So if you'll come, if you want to pray with the prayer teams, they're available for that purpose. And what are the prayer teams going to do? They're going to take you to Jesus. <laughs> 
they're going to set you right. They say, well, they're going to hear you out and they're going to listen to what you have to say, but then they're going to set you before Jesus and say, well, let's ask him. And so I just want to encourage you, pray with the prayer teams. If you want to come kneel at the altar, Jesus is here. If you want to pray right where you're standing in your seat, Jesus is there. And he wants to just extend that hand to him and say, Lord, this is me. This is the withered part. And I need you to heal it. I need you to restore it. I need you to make me whole. Set me free from everything that I'm seeking out that's not just simple faith in the finished work of the cross. And give me this full life in Jesus' name.